नमस्ते एवरीवन वेलकम टू द चारवक पॉडकास्ट दिस इज योर होस्ट कुशल मेहरा सो सिंस लास्ट मंडे जस्टिन ट्रूडो हैज सेट द कैट अमंगस्ट द पिजंस सिंस हिज स्टेटमेंट इन द हाउस ऑफ कॉमंस आई हैव हैड मल्टीपल डिस्कशंस आई हैव बीन ऑन मल्टीपल डिस्कशंस टू हैव दिस बट नथिंग कैन बी कंप्लीट अंटिल एंड अनलेस आई डोंट स्पीक विद माय डियर कैनेडियन फ्रेंड टेरी मिलेवस्की वेटरन ऑथर एंड जर्नलिस्ट फ्रॉम कनाडा इट्स सैड दैट वी आई आई कीप कॉलिंग टेरी टू टॉक अबाउट दीस दीस थिंग्स एंड आई फील सो बैड एंड आई कीप टेलिंग टेरी टेरी वी नीड टू सिट ओवर डिनर्स एंड हैव फन बट टेरी हियर वी आर बट वंस अगेन थैंक यू फॉर कमिंग माय फ्रेंड या इट एंट फन बट एनीवे थैंक यू फॉर द इनविटेशन वी विल एयर सम ऑफ द इश्यूज एनीवे but terry uh, to i i don't want to focus on it's not like i want to avoid the accusations or anything of that sort but today i hope because i consider you a friend i consider canada my second home and uh, i hope we find a solution to this but uh, let's start with uh, as things are when you heard the prime minister of canada making these statements what was your initial reaction i thought it was absurd and unbelievable I uh, have thought since the outset that the whole theory that underlies this uh, accusation uh, was uh, baloney and self-evidently baloney. You'll remember that the whole thing arose out of the idea that somehow because uh, three different Khalistani figures around the world died in a in a period of 2 months which isn't that unusual uh, that therefore it must have been the Indian government. There was no logic, there was no evidence. the first was a gentleman uh, named panjwa in lahore sounded like a drug deal gone bad at least that was one ver- version of the story nothing to do with any hit squad no proof of any hit squad the second was a mr kanda in uh, uh, birmingham england uh, who according to the hospital died of blood cancer leukemia uh, th- th- sorry but the hospital is a, an objective and independent and believable source uh why is a hospital going to in birmingham going to lie to cover something no no assassins burst into his hospital room and shot him full of cancer i don't think that's how it works it was nonsense but the third one adib nijar at his temple in surrey the guru nanak temple that certainly was a contract killing so uh, there's no coincidence i thought at first that this was obviously baloney Uh, and that it would be uh, insane uh, for the indian government to contemplate any such activity and insane even if somebody was acting unofficially uh, without government sanction uh, to have undertaken this kind of operation would be uh, destructive to the relationship between the two countries and it was very hard to complicate uh, to contemplate that anyone would be that stupid frankly it's just a crazy thing to do i mean anyone uh, in british columbia will tell you that you know surrey is well known for organized crime you have contract killings far too often not every week but um you know it's almost one a month it 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 does go on all the time and routinely the police catch the villains i mean a year ago it, we were talking about uh, rapuram and singh malik the financier of the baba khalsa no less who paid for the terrorist group which blew up air india in 1985 and uh, was acquitted at the trial uh, and he had a lot of enemies and he was assassinated in july of last year after having written a gushing letter to narendra modi about the wonderful things that mr modi is doing for the sikhs and that letter of course was seen as treachery by his former friends malik's former friends uh, in the uh, uh, khalistan movement uh, my point being that in that case the police in short order caught the shooters uh, they haven't yet uh, revealed who paid them who paid for the contract uh that would be interesting to know but uh for the indian government to take the risk the enormous risk of blackening its reputation uh, with this kind of uh extrajudicial murder operation uh seemed to me uh, at first completely inconceivable and absurd it would be suicidal they uh, the, the risk of of detection would be too high and the reward what's the reward i mean who was ninja nobody knew who ninja was i mean they they've heard of gopatwan panun perhaps the number 1 in seeks for justice which is organizing the current referendum but the number 2 who's ninja i mean if you asked 9 uh, out of 10 canadians would never have heard of him 
I mean, uh, and, and, and it didn't even make sense to me, to be honest, finally, it, it didn't even make sense to me that the Indians, if they were minded, officially or unofficially, to go after one of these individuals, why him? Why not go after the leader of F uh, Sikhs for Justice or any one of a, a number of other enemies that India has all over the world? There's all kinds of people you, they might want to rub out if that's what they wanted to do. But why Ninja? Didn't make any sense to me at all. Now, I want to ask you another question, which always has baffled me, Terry. The coverage of Nidjar as a character in, in I'm not just saying Canadian media. I don't uh, say this irresponsibly. I'm, I'm very serious when I say this. Nidjar was a, a goon, a terrorist, a, 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 a thug, whatever word you want to use. And there is enough evidence of that out in the public, in the open <clears throat> there was an open red corner notice, Interpol notice for Nidjar. But this portrayal of Nidjar as a Canadian, as a Canadian activist, as, as, as just an innocent person who is a victim of the system. And underneath this, there is an attempt by Canada to deny the obvious. And I don't know. I tried to raise it in a subtle way in our chat last time when you both, you and Sarah, were gracious enough to come on the podcast. And and you know why I said it? Because if and I know this because I live I live in Canada too now uh, on and off, but I live there, and I know there is a certain fear in the in the non-brown Canadians of being called racist. But I once again want to say this. Canada has a Jat Punjabi gang problem. When yes. will Canada own up to it? Yes, it's uh, we, we really missed the boat on um, uh, many of the characters that uh, seem to be living happily in Canada, uh, plotting against India and uh, encountering no resistance at all from the Canadian legal system. I mean, if you look at, uh, at, at this objectively, it seems to me that the Canadians can argue reasonably well, Nidja never blew anything up in Canada. I mean, they call him a terrorist in India, but uh, he hasn't he hasn't threatened us. He's threatening somebody else, not our problem. That's the first thing. They think this old feeling in Canada, that this whole file, the Khalistan file going back 40 years, was not our problem. It's an, it's an Indian problem. Let them deal with it. Uh, we're not to blame. We're not responsible. That's the first thing. The second thing is that even though he has not evidently been blowing things up, he was not blowing anything up in Canada anyway. Nevertheless, he was engaged, like so many others, in uh, propaganda, pro-terrorist propaganda. Look at the speech which, uh, which has emerged in recent days, for example. You've probably seen the tape of his little speech uh, at his temple. You know, this is, you know it, it's not exactly your classical sermon. Is it when the the president of the temple takes the podium and launches into a into a, a tirade in favor of all the wonderful murders we've done? Look how we assassinated Indira Gandhi. Look how we assassinated uh, the chief minister of Punjab, Bayan Singh, in 1995. Look how we assassinated General. Vi Look at all the wonderful murders we've done. And then he says he raises his fist and he says, "This is our legacy." Really. That's your legacy? Murder of elected public officials? Uh, you'd think that would get some attention, wouldn't you? But no, because again, he's not blowing things up. And both sides, in my, uh, my, my guess, is that both sides are still wed. They're a bit out of date. They're wedded to an old model of, well, terrorism equals blowing things up. And if you're not blowing things up, you're okay. Because the rest, the rest is just freedom of speech. Well, it's freedom of speech which undermines the next generation, which teaches children, for example, they send a, 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 a flatbed truck through the streets of Toronto with a celebration, a, 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 a diorama replicating life-size the assassination of Indira Gandhi in 1984 with plenty of red paint on her sari to... Make sure the kids get the message. Number one, this was a bloody affair. Number two, that we're proud of it. We're here celebrating it. Let's do some more. So this propaganda in favor of killers, 
the naming of the referendum campaign after the Air India bomber, Talvinder Palmar, the worst mass murder in Canadian history. Uh, this propaganda is toxic. It's something that government should, should be concerned with, even if they're not blowing things up. And it's not enough to say, uh, as the Prime Minister Trudeau has often said, well, freedom of speech, freedom of speech. Well, I'm a freedom of speech nut. So are you. We're all for freedom of speech. But there has to be a line drawn by sensible governments uh, where it veers into the incitement of violence, when that is the line that should not be crossed. But I'm afraid to report to you that Canada has not drawn that line. For example, uh, Britain 15 years ago, I think, in 2006, the new Terrorism Act came in, in which they included a new offense, gl the glorification of terrorism. We don't have that in Canada. Oh, we do have a recommendation that we should. They had a parliamentary committee in the Senate of Canada, and they came up, I think it's recommendation number 12, in 2015, eight years ago, they recommended, yep, we've got to get after this. Everyone else has done it. The Brits have done it. Other countries in Europe have adopted a similar language. Make the incitement to violence, the glorification of terrorism, make that a criminal offense. And we've done something we, to address this propaganda. And they haven't done it. Nobody's done. Nobody's lifted a finger to introduce such legislation and to pass it. It's just one example. And I, I don't mean to get sort of too legalistic and technical, but if we did that and if we enforced it, we'd go a long way to indicating to our Indian friends that, look, finally, after 40 years, we're starting to get it. We get that these people should be confronted and made and held accountable for what they're doing, poisoning the minds of children. Yeah, but uh, Terry, doesn't uh, Canada already have one law? What was that 2015 Anti-Terrorism Act? which says, yes. quote, who, anyone, quote, who by communicating statements knowingly advocates or promotes the commission of terrorism offenses. But uh, this law is never used and these words are never used against the Khalistanis. So, so I don't understand. Yeah, yeah it, 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 it's a technicality. You can say, you can always, there's always an excuse. Uh, what, te what terrorist offenses? You know, unless you can show a specific offense, uh, then, then the law takes you nowhere. And there are other laws, I, I grant you. Uh, there's a law against hate speech. So that if you attack a, an identifiable group, so you can't say bad things about Asians or Jews or Blacks or whatever, you can't do that if it's an identifiable group. But if you're not a member of an identifiable group, let's say you're just one singular Indian diplomat, for example, you don't qualify as a member of an identifiable group. So you're, somebody fomenting hatred of you is off the hook. So there are a lot of holes in Canadian law, and they should be patched. I don't think this solves the whole problem. I do think that it would serve, you know, you, you introduced this. Uh, you know, we want to be talking about how do we get this ship into safe harbor? How do we solve the problem? How do we deal with it? That's one way in which it seems to me that Canadian law is at fault. And correcting it would be a, a, a good indication that somebody's getting finally serious about confronting the Khalistanis and say, you can't just say anything. You can't have, for example, life-size pictures of Canada's worst mass murderer holding him up as a, as a martyr, a teacher, a great man, and a model for Sikh youth. Yeah, and unless you be accused of uh, concocting something about Nijjar's speech in the Gurdwara, I want to play that, although it's in Punjabi, I think it's very important to play that speech of Nijjar. It's just a 40-second clip, but I want people to hear it uh, so that people cannot accuse Terry of making things up. So here you go. <laughs> ਫੌਜਾਂ ਲੈ ਕੇ ਆਇਆ ਉਹਨੇ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਉਹ ਵੀ ਗੱਡੀ ਚਾੜਿਆ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਲੱਤਰ ਮਾਕੇ ਨਾ ਦਿੱਲੀ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਬੈਠਾ ਸੀ 84 ਦੇ ਕਤਲੇਆਮ ਦਾ ਦੋਸ਼ੀ ਸੀ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਵੀ ਜਿੰਦੇ ਸੁੱਖੇ ਨੇ ਗੱਡੀ ਚਾੜਿਆ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਬਿਆਨਤ ਕਹਿੰਦਾ ਸੀ ਬੁੱਚੜ ਮੈਂ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਸਿਰ ਤੇ ਪੱਗ ਨਹੀਂ ਰਹਿਣ ਦੇਣੀ ਦਲਾਵਰ ਤੇ ਹਵਾਰੇ ਤਾਰੇ ਨੇ ਗੱਡੀ ਚਾ
ਬੰਬ ਬਣ ਕੇ ਇਹ ਮਿਸਾਲ ਆ ਐਂਡ ਫੋਰ ਪੀਪਲ ਹੂ ਆਰ ਨਾਟ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਐਂਡ ਆਰ ਨਾਟ ਅਵਰਸ ਔਰ ਆਰ ਨਾਟ ਯੂਜ਼ ਟੂ ਥਿਸ ਥਿਸ ਇਜ਼ ਅ ਵੈਰੀ ਨਾਰਮਲ ਲਾਈਨ ਇਨ ਖਾਲਿਸਤਾਨੀ 뮤직 ਟੂ ਇਨ ਫੈਕਟ ਦ ਸੌਂਗ ਇਜ਼ ਬੈਂਡ ਨਾਓ ਇਨ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਦ ਫਾਰਮਰ ਇੰਡੀਅਨ ਕੈਨੇਡੀਅਨ primarily indian also canadian uh, hip hop artist siddu muse wala who was also murdered in the same gang war by the way he also in- released a song a song was released by the way very interestingly after siddu passed away but till siddu was alive that song was not released and in that song also there is a line siddu is not singing that line but a line echoing similar sentiments has been added in that line this was released just during the farmers protests were going on in india and this is a standard modus operandi of the entire jat khalistani movement where it is laden with form achismo and that form achismo comes off in the form of we bumped indira gandhi off we bumped general vaidya off we did not leave bian singh we did not leave this person we're not going to leave modi modi you better be careful we'll deal with you also if i speak about it or terry speaks about it we'll get random messages saying we'll look at you also i don't know what to do honestly terry this is it yeah. this is what they it's do. standard procedure and i think that most people in canada are completely unaware of this it's off the map as far as they're concerned and it's been going on for so long that you know i'm not at all ever going to be justifying uh, extra territorial executions by rogue states charging around rubbing out their critics wherever they please in other people's countries but we need to understand i think why indians have become so frustrated by the failure of canada to deal with this yeah it is frustrating i mean you know this evidence matters which is why i'm showing all of this evidence this is nidjer the plumber holding his plumbing ak47 <laughs> this is nidjer right i mean uh, what the hell look at these photos he's holding a ak47 this is you know he's at uh, you know uh, the image says from left to right there is a granthi of gurdwara nankana sahib Jagtar Singh Tara Hardeep Singh Nijjar is there in the photo Surjeet Kohli is at the rooftop of Sarai in the premises of Gurdwara Nankana Sahib nobody needs to know where Nankana Sahib is this is again Mr Nijjar uh, in a rally uh, of is this your plumber the globe and mail this is your plumber i mean what the hell yeah uh, no we 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 we've been missing the boat I I I somebody said it's a very telling anecdote if you allow me to just I, I'll, sure. I'll keep it short. It, 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 when I speak of uh, poisoning the minds of children it sounds very melodramatic Terry's gone off the deep end again uh he's lost it. Well, uh, let me give you a contra- concrete example. This comes from Dave Hayer, friend of mine whose father Tara Singh Hayer uh, was murdered before he could testify and he had devastating testimony to offer. at the Air India trial. So he was silenced. He was murdered. And his son knows a lot about this matter. And he told he tells this story of a young girl he thinks she was about 14 years old who said to him, "Mr. Hayer, why do you refer to the Air India bombers as terrorists when they're heroes?" she said. "They are heroes." And he looked at her with amazement. He said, "What do you mean? I mean, did you ever think of what about the victims' families? What about them?" And she said, "Oh, I never thought of that. I mean it it just makes your blood run cold to think that a young girl is being brought up that way. This is what she learned at home at the Gurdwara. I don't know where she learned it, but she learned it somewhere that 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 we should scoff at, at the Air India victims as the Khalistan movement writ large does generally today. by trying to for example rewrite the history of the air india bombing oh no our guys didn't do it it was done by the indian government uh, and and, and th- th- there's no evidence for this it is completely absurd theory we have abundant proof uh, of who did it but they're still at it trying to rewrite history and teach children that no our guys are in the right and uh, uh, they would never do a thing like that well it's lies and misrepresentations seem to be fundamental to this movement and instead of fighting the information war 
with them and the war against their disinformation, we seem to be stuck in this old paradigm of, well, they, did they blow anything up yet? No, they didn't, so they're off the hook, anything goes. That's what where we're stuck with. And by the way, it cuts both ways. I'm not saying that the Indians are immune to this, because when they try to persuade the Canadians to hand over a suspect, they say, well, he's been blowing things up, because that's the easy way to convince the Canadians. When really, they don't have that much evidence of him blowing things up. Maybe he sent some money to somebody else who used the money to blow things up. But it's a bit more complicated than just saying, well, yeah, he's a terrorist. Well, maybe he's a financier of terror. Maybe it's more complicated. But because they want to show that they're terrorists, they say they're terrorists when they lack evidence. And in some cases, they have failed. The Indians have failed to produce convincing evidence that would pass muster in a Canadian court before somebody can be extradited. Yeah. And, and you know, I think... My criticism of India in this entire process has been communication. And I like let me explain how. So there are co-centric circles. There are actual Khalistanis. Then there are Khalistani sympathizers. The actual Khalistanis are the terrorists. They are the terrorists. They, they go out and actually do the terrorist activity. They go out and they are involved in this. And then there are sympathizers. Unfortunately... Even in the regular Indian discourse at times, and I'm tired of explaining to people that, there, you know, just like there are Islamists and Islamist sympathizers, there are Khalistanis and Khalistani sympathizers, and you need to call the person. Categorization is very important. And, and, and I agree with you because since, you know, India and Canada signed their extradition treaty in 1987 for people who don't know, but only six fugitives have returned to the country uh, from 2002 to 2020. This is a report in the print. And uh, I'm reading the quote of the print directly. The treaty documents and data previewed by the print show uh, this has been tied up in paperwork and made increasingly toothless by lobbying. In June, a standing committee of Canada's parliament called for the country to withdraw from extradition treaties with 10 countries, which includes India, by the way that do not meet, quote, international human rights standards, quote, authorities in Canada have been extremely reluctant to bring extradition proceedings for fear of backlash from an organized and well-funded Khalistani lobby. An Indian police officer dealing with the cases told the print. Uh, another quote was given, uh, quote, a senior NIA officer told the print that extradition requests submitted by state police forces in India also rely heavily on statements made by an accused in custody against the fugitive. In addition, police investigators have been challenged for failing to record the testimony of incarcerated suspects in question and answer format instead of as summaries written by investigative officers. So I'm actually backing up what you're saying. This is a classic Indian bureaucratic nightmare because of which average Punjabis suffer both in India and Canada. So I actually wanted to back you up. Here. It's yes, a and, and, and India has damaged its own cause in many respects. Uh, by, there's no doubt, in, in the past there's been a history, let's admit it, of serious abuses in Indian prisons uh, by the police, especially in Punjab. And there's, there's no point in denying it and then getting caught out in court when you find out that it's all true. So it, I, I don't mean it's all true, but some of it is true. And so that uh, Canada's reluctance to return people to the prospect of abuse in India has informed much of this reluctance to return them at all. And they, let's face it, any Canadian uh, government is going to face a lot of blowback from a very organized and, and uh, disciplined uh, community, which is going to say to them, you can't send these people back. Look what happened. Even if just one case, they'll point to that case and say, look what happens in, in India. You can't send people to that, that to that justice system because it's not justice and uh, it's not perfect. Uh, it's not up to Canadian standards anyway. And that too needs to be addressed. Both sides have some problems that should be addressed. Never mind the killing, take the killing of Nidra out of it for the moment and acknowledge that maybe there's a good thing here that a spotlight is now shining upon these problems. Maybe, to, uh, maybe it's shining uh, hotly enough to encourage both sides to address 
the problems that they have domestically uh, that, that they need to address in order to go forward. And I, I, I'm hopeful about that, but I, I wish I could pre present some actual evidence that it's moving that way. Not yet, anyway. We're still yeah, in the fighting stage. Yeah, talking about Canadian standards, Teddy, what did you make of the statement of the Premier of British Columbia, David uh, Eby? It, it was, it, this was something, I mean, I want to play it for the benefit of our listeners and viewers. In the public realm, uh, the only briefings uh, that I've been able to receive from CSIS are what are called open information briefings or open source uh, briefings, which is information that's available to the public uh, uh, doing an internet search, uh, which I find frustrating. And, um, and so uh, to be transparent about that information that I've received, uh, in terms of the specific incident in Surrey, I was uh, uh, contacted uh, by the Prime Minister. He briefed me uh, about what he was going to say in the Parliament, which he then went on and said. Uh, he offered to me uh, a briefing from CSIS, which, of course, I said, yes, I would like that. We arranged it. We got a briefing from the director. Uh, which uh, was, as I say, open source information. Uh, and then uh, and then that was it. I expressed my frustration uh, in the meeting with the CSIS director about uh, our inability to get more concrete information about this kind of thing. Uh, and, uh, and I have articulated that uh, to the federal government. I understand there may need to be reform around the act that governs CSIS in order for them to be able to share this information. If that's what's required, let's make it happen. Uh, because the only way that we're going to make traction on this uh, is uh, is by the federal government trusting the provincial government with information and being able to uh, act on it in our local communities. So this is fascinating that the premier of British Columbia, I think this person in this particular case is the one in the firing line because Niger was from that province and he was living there and uh, the problem per se if we were to talk about is, is originating in Surrey which is a city which is part of British Columbia and here you have an absurd thing in the Canadian system where um, uh, for Indians when when the word premier is used uh, people in India it means a chief minister in our language yeah. yeah they're called premiers in Canada so in India uh, chief ministers Terry are consistently given intelligence their intelligence is shared. In fact, there is a home ministry of uh, uh, the chief minister too. And uh, to me, when I heard about this aspect of the Canadian system where everything is kept hush-hush and the, and the premier is kept out of it and he's saying, well, I only was shown what is publicly available through an internet search. I mean, isn't this appalling? Um, no, I, I, I differ with you on this point. Uh, I was extremely underwhelmed by uh, this statement, not because there was anything wrong with it. I understand the, the Premier's frustration. I share it. I'd like to have the information too, uh, <laughs> the real information, not just the public stuff, right? Um, but I, I, I was underwhelmed by uh, the immense interest and the su suggestion, particularly in the Indian media, uh, that this was proof. You see, you see, Trudeau has nothing. All he's got is uh, what he could Google. Uh, and this was a very popular line in India, and it's also nonsense. That's not the issue. The issue is that Premier Ebi doesn't have a security clearance. J but Jagmeet Singh does. He has a security clearance. He leads the National uh, New Democratic Party, which sustains Justin Trudeau's minority government, does it not? So they're in an alliance to prop up the government, and uh, he, he has a security clearance. And so he has, by his own account, received a more uh, a useful briefing, which does include at least some of the classified or secret information, uh, which uh, Justin Trudeau says was presented to the Indian side. So it's not, it, it's really a technical matter that the premier doesn't have a security briefing. It's against the law for the government to give him stuff whether he isn't cleared for, and we might be able to fix that, yes. But that doesn't mean the information doesn't exist. It doesn't mean that the Canadians don't have uh, highly sensitive signals intelligence, some of it coming from the United States, under the conditions of the Five Eyes rules on the sharing. The information can be shared, but not with the public. The in information is shared among the governments within that bubble of secrecy but you can't receive information from the Americans, for example, and then blab about it on television. You've got to keep it quiet. So I understand 
the mechanics of how the system works so that the pr prime minister is not able to reveal all of this information to the public. However, he can change that. He can decide that as the prime minister, he's going to present selected, redacted, edited, whatever he likes, some portion of the evidence that will persuade the public because he's already he's already blown the secrecy, hasn't he? He's already done it. There's no point saying, oh, well, it's classified. I can't talk about it. Or I don't want to upset the, uh, the investigation. I don't want to prejudice the investigation. Sorry, he's already done that. He's announced the conclusion of the investigation by kicking out an Indian diplomat. He's pointing the finger at India as, as, the, as the culprit. I mean, so that, that phase, it seems to me, is over. And I think it's wrong. And I think it's foolish uh, for the Canadian government uh, to say to Canadians, no, no, I, we're not going to let you have this information, having used it ourselves as a government to wreck the, uh, this extremely important relationship with India, which we were in the process of trying to nurture and improve. Uh, I think it's nonsense that, that he can't reveal it. And if it does um, prejudice the investigation, and ultimately some guy is brought to trial and says, well, I mean, I can't have a fair trial. The prime minister says the, the allegations are credible. So I, I'm off the hook. I, I, don't, I don't care. I don't care if the individual concerned gets off the hook because of the breach of confidentiality, because it's, it's too important. It's more important than that is that this rift between the two countries be repaired, seems to me. But um, here's the interesting bit. So Shashir Gupta has been, uh, you know, he's a, a, just like you are a veteran Canadian journalist, Shashir is a veteran Indian journalist for Hindustan Times. He has been writing on national security and foreign affairs for a long, long time. And Shashir spoke to his sources in the government and he directly quoted, and I mean, when I say directly quoted, directly quoted the government saying, we have not received anything from the Canadians now, why would Shishir make such a statement where there is no actionable evidence, no actual names being shared from the Canadian side? Then, then the question one needs to ask. And then I wondered, I wonder if you read this uh, very interesting <clears throat> headline of the Washington Post. It was yeah. an article written by Maham Javed and Evan Hill, which said video of Sikh leaders killing shows coordinated attack. Now <clears throat> When I read this article, I mean, I'm just someone, before people start judging me, I'm just fascinated by gang wars. I, I follow gang wars, gang hits everywhere. It's just look at the smile on Terry's face. Terry's like, what am I getting myself into? <laughs> but I mean, I tend to read how gang hits happen, whether it's the blood versus the Crips in America, whether it's the Khalistani gang wars or the Sri Lankan gang wars in, in Canada, or there are gang wars in India gangs behave in a certain pattern. And when I read the explanation in this article, I was like, yeah, sounds like another gang hit. And is this the evidence they're trying to leak, Terry? Like 50 bullets were sprayed and the, first of all, uh, I mean, the first reaction, I, I always, hit him. yeah, I mean, let's get real. The India and Indian bureaucracy, they are the cheapest people I know alive cheapest people I know alive. They're not wasting 50 bullets on Nijar. No, it, 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 it doesn't really ring true, does it? Although the size of the operation, you know, with two cars, the getaway car and the other car that blocked Hardeep's uh, passage, uh, Hardeep Nijar's passage out of the parking lot of his temple, uh, it, you know, it, it does seem quite elaborate. And it's also very interesting that no arrests have been made. The police have been silent. We've heard nothing from the police that they've made any progress at all in solving the case. They have certainly not made any connection with the Indian government. So it's a puzzle to me, I must say, how the government of Canada can say that they have solved the case at the higher level. They know who paid these guys, but they don't know who these guys are. They have no suspect. Uh, that, that, that is baffling to me. So enough of this. Enough of this wondering and speculating uh, uh, you know, it, it makes work for us, I guess. Uh, you know, we can bloviate about it all day long, but we don't have the facts. We need the facts. And so 
does the rest of the world, so does the, uh, the, so do Indians and so do Canadians. They need to know what has Trudeau got. Produce the goods or he's finished, it seems to me, as a, as a political matter. I, I don't think he could survive as prime minister, having bet uh, his uh, prime ministership on this. And then if he can't produce the evidence, then he loses that bet, doesn't he? Uh, and at the same time, I think it also behooves people to remember on the Indian side, uh, they don't like to talk about this too much. They shut me down if I mention it uh, on I Indian Network TV. But Mr. Modi, remember, he knows what it is. He knows what the evidence is. Can you imagine for a moment, just bear with me, can you imagine for a moment that when Trudeau approached Modi for that brief and frosty meeting at the G20 in New Delhi, that he that Modi sat there like a potted plant and asked no questions? When Trudeau brought it up to him, as he says in his words, in no uncertain terms. Now, can you imagine, put it another way, can you imagine that Prime Minister Narendra Modi, of all people, and he's a pretty tough guy, can you imagine that he would have outright rejected Trudeau's allegations as he did if he did not know what they were? Well, of course he knew what they were, and he made it, he'd make it his business to find out what are the Canadians talking about? What are these allegations? So he could, he could blow Trudeau out of the water, is my point. If he chose to, if he's innocent, if he could say, look, I know why Trudeau doesn't want to reveal his evidence is because it's nonsense. It's rubbish. And here's why it's rubbish. Here's what he's saying. This guy wasn't there. He was in some other, uh, in some other country. Uh, that's not his phone number. Oh, whatever. He's got an alibi. He's got, he's got a reason why it's rubbish. If he could do that, then don't you think he would? But I find it curious that he's not doing that. He's saying as little as possible. I mean, even the word absurd, that's, that's coming, coming from the foreign minister, Jashanka. So uh, we're not seeing Modi step up here and say, OK, here's why what the Canadians are doing is wrong. And here's why Trudeau's uh, allegations are a crock. Not doing it. Yeah, no, and, and uh, as you know, I will never uh, disagree when you say something as reasonable as this. I do expect my prime minister to speak up. I do expect my prime minister to come up. And uh, unlike mainstream media channels in India who are too sensitive about these things, I'm not. I don't care. I mean, I, I, I criticize my government all the time. And very interestingly, I say this, I want to say this on the record, this podcast has been has been criticizing the government on multiple occasions. This podcast has criticized his own native faith, Hinduism, on multiple occasions. But I, I say this with a lot of pride. Not once have I received any threats from the Hindu community. Or, interestingly, Terry, the BJP has never called me and told me to stop criticizing them. They have never called me to. to and, and I want to state this on the record. I have never been called. But again, I wanted to share this uh, Hindustan Times article by Shishir, uh, where he said Canada has not shared any evidence with India at any level on the possible involvement of Indian intelligence agencies in the murder. The wording is very interesting, uh, uh, Terry. The possible involvement of Indian agencies. intelligence agencies. So, so what they're denying is that uh, the state apparatus is not involved. That's what they're saying. So, what could have happened is it is an internecine gang war. Now, why I keep on bringing the gang angle is 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 that there are two countries right now that are suffering because of Jat Punjabi gang wars. We we literally know of an open gangster hiding somewhere in Canada called Goldie Brar. And yes. one is sitting in an Indian jail of all the places called Lawrence Bishnoi. Yes. In this entire mess of Indo-Canadian gang wars, where, and, and it is just not restricted to Indian Punjab, it has spread its tentacles to two, three states in India, the Lawrence Bishnoi gang. And what is happening is Goldie Brar hits at someone who's part of the Bishnoi gang. It, people don't realize even the Sidhu Musewala murder had this gang war element in it. And the Canadian government, for some odd reason, uh, I mean, the, the most like, if one was to use the Occam's razor, 
the most likely explanation of the nijjar murder if you look at the pattern overall whether it was who was that ripudaman malik who was uh, bumped off um, last year in in british july Columbia? of last year yes, yes. July, july was last, last year, year. And, the, and he was opposed to the Niger group, right? Ripudavan Malik was opposed to the Niger group and the allegations were there were some Mexican cartels involved. Now even the Mexicans have come into the Punjabi gang war. I have no idea what the hell is happening here. But the point is, this is very clearly a consistent problem. And it, instead instead of cooperating, and my criticism is both India and Canada, and I say this as an Indian citizen who also visits Canada all the time, Damn it, you should be working together. Both the RCMP and Punjab police primarily have to be doing joint ops and fixing this problem, Terry. But instead of that, they have made everybody's life a living hell. There's no question that uh, the first option when Mr. Malik was killed and when Mr. Nijar was killed a little more than a year later, uh, a little less, because he was killed in June, June, of eight, June of the, the 18th of this year. And Malik was killed in uh, the middle of July of last year. And the first option, by way of explanation, was gang wars. Uh, and, and that theory, by the way, has uh, something which the Indian government theory lacks, and that is actual pieces of hard evidence. You mentioned the bad blood between the Malik camp and the, and the Nijar camp, camp. Number one, uh, Malik's gushing letter to Narendra Modi. That's public. That's an actual piece of evidence that, yes, Malik, despite his background as an Air India suspect, uh, that he was kissing up to Modi, if you will. Lavish praise in this letter. Number two, a lawsuit between the Malik camp and the Nijar camp. This was over printing press and whether Malik could cash in printing the Sikoli book, the Guru Granth Sahib, uh, without the permission of the religious authorities in, in Amritsar. I'll spare you the details, but the printing press ended up at Haji Nijar's temple, the Godwara, Guru, Nan, uh, Guru Nanak, uh, and there was a lawsuit over that. And then we also have two other pieces of evidence, which are interviews and speeches by the two men trashing each other. Malik, in his last interview, describing Nijar as a bully, uh, Nijar in a speech uh, attacking Malik. Uh, so we have these little, you can say it doesn't add up to a whole lot, but at least it's something. It's more than we have on the side of a, 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 the, quote, Indian government theory uh, that uh, some sort of flying squad of uh, Modi's hired killers has fanned out across the world to wipe out uh, Khalistani uh, figures around the world. I, I, it, it sounds a bit fantastic. The third option, though, is a blend of the two. The third option is the notion that perhaps in pursuing its revenge against Mr. Nijjar, the Malik, Malik camp was serving the Indian government's interest. Maybe the, the Indian government, maybe they knew something about it. Maybe they had picked up some intelligence and kind of let it happen. Maybe somebody was caught on a wiretap saying, for example, aha, we've got that guy. Now, does that mean that uh, your team scored a goal? Or does that mean that you were one of the players on the field? Uh, it's subject to interpretation. Signals intelligence is always subject to interpretation. But you can see why the, the, gang, the possibility of a gang connection is uh, of real interest, would be of real interest to the police and to everybody else. And, and I think that leads us right back to, to my theory in the first place, which it is time, it is past time for Trudeau and his government to produce what they've got. And the hell with whether it prejudices the, uh, the trial at some future date, if there ever is one. The hell with that. It, it, it's time to either put up or shut up. But uh, I, I would like to add one more angle to this uh, entire thing over here is that, uh, let's be very clear, no Indian would be unhappy about the fact that Nijer is dead. I just want to say it very openly. It's not like, you know, somebody gets up in the morning and says, hey, did you know uh, Nijer was uh, uh, shot by someone? The first reaction from the topmost diplomat to the average person on the street would be good. It doesn't matter which religion they belong to. Now, uh, the, 
see, this is my problem with Intel sharing. Uh, what if Canada must have shared something like an Indian diplomat got a random call or something where they said, hey, Nijar got bumped off. Good. He should be dead. And, and you know, I mean, uh, Indians are known to be emotional people. And in a moment of rush, you know, your diplomat, our diplomat must have said, and and and, yeah. and the Canadian, and, and yeah, I just want to state it on the record. You know, Indians are trying to bring this angle. Oh my God, America and Canada was spying on us. Listen, everybody spies on each other. We spy yeah. on you, you spy on They're us. They're not shocked. They are not shocked. <laughs> Everybody's spying on each other. Let's get real. We all spy on each other. Like, uh, after, and you're a veteran journalist. I'm just in this for last 10 years, and I know how many eyes and ears are on us. Forget the freaking government officials. I mean, it's it's just obvious. You just, after a while, you live your life assuming everybody knows what you're talking about. It's yeah. Just, it's just the it's just the life yeah. and i the and i don't always to... make yeah always make sure you just spell the names out so they get them right you know? <laughs> and, and yeah i mean i don't need to tell a journalist of 40 plus years like terry Vilaski that the government listens to him i mean he knows it very well everybody knows i wish they guys. did <laughs> <laughs> i've got all kinds of great ideas but, yeah it, but, it, it, but seriously it you're you i think that you're on the right track they're on the right track to introduce the gang element as central to this. And I think we should be discussing the idea of uh, blended motivations and a conversation being captured like the one I proposed or the one you proposed where somebody is applauding it and it's ambiguous whether that means that they were involved in it or they just like the outcome. And remember that Canadians too are not crying in their beer about the death of Mr. Nidger. They're not shedding tears for him. And they are now, I mean, like this, there's a very, been a very interesting development. I'm sure you've noticed how at the outset, when this first broke, that the Khalistanis in Canada were jumping for joy, were they not? They were uh, all over Twitter saying, aha, you see, we've been vindicated. The prime minister himself has endorsed our story that the Indians are killer. The Indian government is a killer government. And uh, you see, we were right all along and this proves it. And they were happy. And then, of course, the spotlight of publicity was very quickly trained upon them. And, well, who was this Mr. Nidja? Because, as I said earlier, they'd never heard of him before, most people. Exactly. And then they find out, then they see the, the, the speech, which you cleverly had all lined up uh, to, to play for your audience. Uh, th this is what Nidja was about, huh? Oh, we killed him and we killed her and we killed him. This is great. Let's kill some more. Um, so suddenly... Canadians who have been largely indifferent to the whole Khalistani movement because it hasn't really impacted them, now realize what they did not know about the Khalistan movement and its devotion, uh, its worship of terrorists and terrorism. And they don't like it. And I don't think that the Khalistanis are quite so overjoyed now by these developments because that spotlight is getting a little hot. Not only that, there was a poster in, in outside of Gurdwara for weeks on, which clearly said, assassinate, assassinate. And then suddenly, in the last couple of days or three, three days ago, those Gurdwara posters come down. Ah, color me skeptical. What happened now? Yeah, it's, it, it's a good question. I mean, it, the timing was interesting, wasn't it? That... Uh, because the spotlight had turned on them, and everyone was saying, "Well, look, I mean, th 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 this is what this is the face they have chosen to present to the world." We're talking about giant posters. Remember, the size of a hoardings, really, the size of a house in front of the Gurdwara where Najjar was killed, and they say "wanted" in letters a foot high, naming and shaming the Indian diplomats, and they say "assassination." And uh, it's it's not a pretty picture. And I think that somebody recognized that maybe this isn't the time uh, to have these posters in Canadians' faces because we are suffering from the blowback. We are being net noticed to an extent that's uh, really more than we had planned. And not just that, as if this was not enough, you know, Gur Gurpatwan Pannu has recently... Yeah issued a fresh threat 
So Pannu now says, you know, he already put a target on the back of every single Canadian Hindu by telling Canadian Hindus to leave Canada. As if that was not enough, he says, he's issued a threat. So, you know, Indian journalist Aditya Rajkol got a call from Pannu or his associates stating that the ICC Cricket World Cup match on 5th of October at Narendra Modi Stadium in Gujarat, you know, this will be the beginning of the World Terror Cup. Why? And, and for people who don't know, Pannu is the lawyer of Nijar. Pannu heads six for justice. Is this the justice? Is this how justice is served, Terry? And, and why does Canada let this man roam freely in and America? Because he lives in America, in New York. Yeah, but I believe he also has Canadian citizenship. Yes, he does. So he's able to operate successfully in both countries. And he has freedom of speech in both countries. And boy, does he tiptoe up to the edge of that line. Again, we're talking about a problem of ignorance and uh, in the face of disinformation. Uh, people are not picking holes in uh, Panun's sto latest story because they've got to get to work on time. Uh, they're, they're not interested. It doesn't impact them. But if you if you do start to look and keep track, uh, as I do, of Panun's activities, you see the videos that he produces praising suicide bombers and various assassins. You see the one that is called I Am Dilawa. That is his video in which he praises the suicide bomber who murdered the chief minister of Punjab, Bayant Singh, in 1995. And, uh, uh, and uh, he uses that to indicate that the video is designed as a threat against the then chief minister of Punjab, Captain Amarinda Singh. And it features, for example, a nice portrait of Captain Amarinda as the chief minister being shredded by machine gun fire as Panoon explains that, you know, th this is the fate that you, Captain Amarinda, will, will uh, face, just like Bayant Singh did back in the day, and then cuts to a picture of the exploded uh, automobile in which uh, Bayant Singh was blown up in 95. So, I mean, it's, it's really quite bloodthirsty stuff, and that's, and that's just typical. And there are videos of where Panoon burns the Indian flag and praises all kinds of other uh, uh, assassins and urges, uh, uh, seeks, uh, seeks soldiers fighting in the north to desert the Indian army and go and fight for the Chinese. Uh, he urges, seeks to uh, take over and seize Delhi airport. And on and on and on. All of these examples of the propaganda that uh, Panun puts out on a daily basis. Now, uh, I, I, I welcome uh, lawyers to step forward and say, well, this is freedom of speech as it's defined. But uh, regardless of whether it's criminal or not, it does seem to be something that deserves some form of reaction by way of official condemnation. I mean, uh, the problem that we're facing is that Canadian politicians, they never say a word about, for example, the, the posters glorifying the Air India bomber, he slaughtered 331 innocent civilians, and here's his picture life-size with ornate turban and ceremonial sword, a glamour shot of Talvinder Palmar stuck on the outside of an important Gurdwara in Surrey, British Columbia. And nobody says boo. I mean, maybe the lawyers are right and it's all freedom of speech and so it's, fine. it's not criminal, but is it okay? Well, apparently it is because the politicians routinely show up smile and wave at the Vaisakhi Parade as the posters of Palmar and all the other martyrs, the killers of General Vaidya go by on the next float, and the killers of uh, Indira Gandhi go by on the next one, and the suicide bomber who blew up uh, Bayan Singh. So I'm saying that you can argue, good luck to you, you'll probably win that it's freedom of speech under Canadian law as it currently stands. And I'm all for freedom of speech, but I have freedom of speech too. The politicians have freedom of speech too. Why don't they use it to denounce these activities? And so far, it's been almost entirely silence. Yeah, there is silence because, um, like it or not, Terry, it was very interesting that when Pannu made this attack on Hindus in Canada, 
So the Canadian political system was forced to speak for Hindus, but none of them still use the K word, the Khalistan word, or they named Pannu by name, which is very interesting. And just to add more evidence to the gang angle, because I'm convinced this is an internecine Indo-Canadian gang war. I mean, these are the pictures released by the national investigation agencies that uh, that details the terror gangster network with its link to Canada. And it has named Lawrence Vishnoi, Jasteep Singh, Kala Jatheri, Elia Sandeep, Virinder Pratap, Elias Kala Rana. Then you have Juginder Singh, Rajesh Kumar, Elias uh, Raju Mota, Raj Kumar, Elias Raju Basoda, Basodi, Anil Chippi, Mohammad Shabazz Ansari, Goldie Brar, uh, Sachin Thapan Bishnoi, Anmol Bishnoi, Vikramjeet Singh, alias Vikram Brar, Dharma, uh, Dharman Singh, alias Dharman Jyot Kalon, Arshdeep Singh Gill, Surender Singh, alias Chiku, Dalip Kumar, alias Bhola, Parveen Vadhva, alias Prince, Yudhvir Singh, and Vikas Singh. These are the gangsters that India has named openly. And I can assure you, you can find them and these names. Recently, one more person passed. He was shot in Winnipeg. And he was literally in one of the NIL lists that India has issued. So it's not like India is speaking out of his ass, literally. There is this gang angle. But Terry, I want to talk about solutions before we wrap up. Because as someone who likes Canada, loves India and Canada both, I want this kerfuffle, because that's the right word. It's a kerfuffle to end. We are not enemy nations. We're not enemy states. We are not hostile to each other. How the hell do we solve this, Terry? Well, I can let me first suggest here, here's how not to do it. And that is uh, to act as uh, Justin Trudeau did when the initial uh, fracas developed over the posters, uh, the, um, the confrontation began to brew before the G20 uh, and before he made his allegations that he said were credible. Uh, when the Prime Minister said that um, uh, the Indians were wrong to suggest that he was soft on Khalistanis uh, because of vote bank politics, which is the allegation that had been made at the time by Foreign Minister Jaishankar. And the Prime Minister stepped up to the microphone and said, they are wrong. We have always been there to push back against hate and against uh, terrorism. Well, that's exactly the wrong answer to me with respect, because, of course, Canada's record of stepping up uh, in on the Khalistan file is absolutely abysmal. It's a disgrace. It's Canada's treatment of that file has been a national disgrace, in my view. So flip it around. Imagine if the, Can the Canadian prime minister, this one or the next one, if this one falls, as the polls say he will. I saw a poll this morning. The Liberals are 12 points behind now. Um, imagine that a Canadian Prime Minister steps up and says, look, it's time for us to acknowledge that Canada has not done well on this file. Uh, we have not taken action, and we intend to do so. And for starters, we're going to aggressively deal with people that India wants to have returned uh, of all criminal cases. Uh, we're going to uh, arrest people um, and uh, aggressively investigate these cases. And we're going to uh, do something about our laws so that the endorsement of terror, the incitement to violence, the glorification of terrorists and terrorism is going to become illegal in Canada. And we're going to show the Indians that we do get it. And if in return, the Indians would say, look, uh, it turns out we're not going to admit that this was a, a, an agent of the Indian government acting at the orders of the prime minister or anything crazy like that. No, we're going to soften the blow. But we are going to admit that somebody who had some vague association, we never liked him anyway. We hardly knew him. Uh, he was fired anyway. But somebody who had a remote link to the Indian government, uh, did indeed somehow get the idea that he should help out with the killing of Mr. Nidda. So, so we're going to acknowledge a little bit of blame here. And in return, we're also going to acknowledge Canada's new effort 
uh, to crack down. Uh, we are we're appreciative of that effort, and in, in turn, we're going to do a better job of providing Canada with information that will meet Canadian legal standards. And we do understand freedom of speech, because that, that's a weakness in the, in the Indian case. When Indians say, that's not freedom of speech, you know, we're talking about the referendum, for example, people are vote, having a free vote peacefully. And India says, how can Canada allow this? And they bang the table and say it shouldn't be allowed. Well, India is going to have to accept that no Western democracy is going to abolish freedom of speech in order to please the Indians. They may have lots of geopolitical clout nowadays, but sorry, that they can't do. That this, this is sacred. And as long as Canada is going to amend its description of what is included under the heading of free speech, to exclude the incitement of violence, then that's fine with us. India needs to be a little more sophisticated about that. They're not going to win. It's not a winning strategy. I want India to have a winning strategy. And that isn't it, to bang the table about freedom of speech. Uh, redefinition, yes. Getting rid of it, no. So uh, if both sides were to take these modest steps, it doesn't seem to be revolutionary, modest steps. And of course, that you know they're not going to do it paint it as a concession. Neither side will say that. You know, we're, we're happy uh, that we're uh, look, taking a second look at this, and we think that this is going to set uh, our relations on a better path. Now, this is, this is something. And right now, we've got nothing. Yeah. I, I, I want to back you up on the freedom of speech issue. Uh, and I know this is going to annoy my Indian listeners especially or people of indian origin living in canada do i like when the indian flag is burnt no should i support the heinous act of burning the indian flag outside india because that is their law yes i don't care if they burn the indian flag let them burn the indian flag it should not bother me but here's my answer as a follow-up to that it's within canada's freedom laws and America's freedom laws to burn any flag they want to. They, they can. India should, what India should have done, which India is doing right now is, there is an Indian system called the Overseas Citizenship of India, which a lot of people now, and Terry, I can assure you, this is the next spin that is going to come in Western media outlets. India cancels citizenship. First of all, the OCI is not a right. It is a privilege that is given to people of Indian origin for their ease, so that they can work in India if they want to. They cannot vote in India. They cannot buy agricultural land in India, but they can work in India. They can go back and forth for people like my wife. But OCI is a privilege that India gives you if you behave yourself and don't act uh, or indulge in activities that is going to break, you know, break India into pieces or burn the yeah. Indian flag. Anybody who is seen doing that should remember that their OCIs will be cancelled. And there is a UAPA law in India, which is, if you ask me, extremely draconian. But, oh boy, the Indian state is going to use that law against you. Confiscate your properties. And let me tell you, the one thing that hurts the judge especially, and I'm going to say something very problematic, which I can back with data, but judges are the landlords of India. More than 80% of the land in India there is a caste apartheid in Indian Punjab. 33% of the Indian Punjabi population is Dalit. They own less than 3% land. Juts own more than 80% land. So to all the Juts indulging in Khalistan, remember the Indian state now will look at you, target your OCIs, confiscate your lands, and then don't cry that this happened to you. And please use Canadian freedom of speech because India has every right to protect its sovereignty because I'll tell you why India is doing it now. In fact, Terry, in the last three years, the biggest criticism of Indian origin Canadians and Indians in India of the Modi government has been they were too soft on the Khalistanis. Everything that India is doing right now. Did you notice, Terry, that the, the protest yesterday had only 30 people or 40 people in it? Suddenly, yeah, it the 400 good. people. Yes. It was a small demonstration, wasn't it? It was yeah, supposed and, to be like a thousand, but it yeah, wasn't. And, 
Yeah, they, all of them have disappeared, Terry. Why? You know, I was wondering why, why, where did all these people go now? Because they know now the Indian government has categorically stated, you do it and see what we do to you and your property in India. And these people, they can't let go of their property because uh, as a Punjabi, I know the Punjabi psyche. The Punjabi psyche is obsessed with land. It, it is a land obsessed psyche. And the Indian government was if there is one criticism of Narendra Modi, it is he goes out of the way when it comes to the Punjabis. That is a criticism coming from a Punjabi. Let me tell you, if this was any other community indulging in such shenanigans in India, the Indian government would have come on them like a house on fire. But Narendra Modi, I don't know, for some reason has a soft corner for Punjabis. He lets them get away with all kinds of nonsense. And this is coming out of my mouth of Punjabi. It's coming out of my mouth. So uh, it, it, they better watch out is all I can say. Yeah. It's all I can say. Um, yeah. Kushal, I, I've got uh, somebody calling me with a bit of an emergency. It's not that, that critical, sure. but I would like to, if you don't mind, wrap up a couple of minutes early. Sure, sure, uh, if, sure, if sure. That's we'll okay, do that. okay with you. I, no I think I, I feel like I made my points, and I, I think you had a pretty, you got, got certainly made yourself worthy of being commented upon. Uh, and and I enjoy this, but if you don't mind, I would like to duck out a couple of minutes early, just so I can. Sure, deal sure. With we, we'll wrap it up, Terry. Uh, uh, as always, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, the Canadian government does not get mad at me and does not start and, and lets me come to Canada. <laughs> That's all. Yeah, I I th I mean, well, well, we'll give you a special a special extra dollar for freedom of speech uh, because you've been kind. Uh, but just watch it. Just be careful. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's it, it's a it's a very tricky issue. I, I I'm and and I think people will be critical of what we have said here uh, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, they want less freedom of speech. They want more freedom of speech. Uh, and uh, some people will be in favor, uh, will they not, of being allowed to uh, portray uh, Dovinder Pama? As a great hero, for example, and you know he's our hero, and we're entitled to put up pictures, and that's freedom of speech. And let 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 them go for it, you know, try it. But uh, at the moment, um, these seem to me irritants which should be addressed. And uh, better, wiser heads than ours will perhaps draft laws that would uh, touch upon these things. But I, I simply remind you that other countries have done this. Other countries have addressed this question of uh, how far does freedom of speech go? Remember the G20 that Prime Minister Rishi Sunak of Britain, and not just because he's a Hindu, but because of what he said, became a hero at the G20 in New Delhi, in contrast to Justin Trudeau, by saying, hey, no, we are not going to allow any space for Khalistani extremism uh, in Britain. We're going to go after it. And, of course, he had the legislation to back him up. Uh, and, uh, and, and they do intend, and they have been uh, pushing back. There was a very interesting report in Britain about the bullying and intimidation of mainstream Sikhs in, in the UK, which is second after Canada is the largest Sikh diaspora in the world. Uh, it was called the Bloom Review, and it was by uh, uh, an expert who was hired uh, by the Boris Johnson government originally to look at how the government intersects with religion. And on the uh, Sikh file, on that part of the report, he says, we have a problem. We, we have got, uh, you know, respectable, mainstream, taxpaying, uh, law-abiding Sikhs in Britain who are being bullied and intimidated by extremists trying to force them to adopt and demonstrate for an independent Khalistan, to try to force them to adopt their agenda. And we better be on the lookout for this. And the stories he told, you know, he had one case where he said he had a, a British member of parliament in tears over what had been happening to him, with people pressuring him and his family and coming to his home. And, and, and Britain is a place where, as you know, the Sikhs are very well advanced in society. They have members of the House of Lords, Lord Singh of Wimbledon, Lord Sahota. I mean, they're, they're well established in Britain as they are in Canada. But uh, I found it very interesting that it's not just in Canada 
that this aggression uh, by uh, Khalistanis and extremists uh, has become a real problem uh, in the modern age, of course, all enabled by the cheapness and the ease with which they can become keyboard warriors. You know, just all you need is an internet connection and a, and a, and a, a, a false name, <laughs> and you can go to war. Uh, and so it's, it's happening in Australia. It's happening in New Zealand. There's a very gory case, and probably you, you know of it, in, in New Zealand that is unfolding in court right now about a, a critic of the extremists who opened his mouth and was uh, beaten almost to death and stabbed uh, by, was it four or five? Anyway, uh, men who are now on trial. Uh, so it's all over, and it, Canada's in the spotlight now, but it's not just us. And I think it's time for a pushback. And uh, you've got some ideas. I've got some ideas. I'm sure that sensible people will throw them out, but they better come up with their own ideas if they don't like ours. How's that? Yeah, I, I agree with you. And and you know what saddens me in this entire process is that I want to repeat it again and again. Canada is a country that I really like. Canadians are one of the nicest people, people uh, you'll meet. And Indians aren't too bad either. And, and it just saddens me to see where Indo-Canadian government relations have gone down the barrel. It hurts me. I mean, I, I remember... I think it was two, three months ago when I had messaged Terry and, you know, I was just saying it in a tongue in cheek way, Terry, we should be signing a trade deal and look where we have come, Terry, look where we have come. And I didn't know what, what was going to happen at that time, but I was telling Terry, look, both the countries could benefit immensely from the trade deal. Uh, you know, Canadians could prosper, Indians could prosper. So many Indian students come to Canada. I, mean, I have to say in the last 10 days, I want to repeat it again to every single Indian student who emailed me panicking about what's their future in Canada. Canada. I want all of you to realize Canada is a nice country. They, they will not harm you. So please don't panic. Uh, calm down. This is just a phase. We're going to go, uh, you know, we're going to go through a little bit of a rough, turbulent time in this journey, but everything will be fine. But, but Terry, my dear friend, thank you very much for coming. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. I know you have to go, so I'll let you go now. But thank you very much once again for coming. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Those are great questions. Well done. Thank, thank you. Take care. Bye take for care, now. Bye. 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 All right, guys, we'll wrap today's discussion up. And uh, before I wrap it up, once again, I want to remind all of you, that if you are an Indian student uh, studying in Canada and are a little bit tensed and uh, want to contact me, my email is open for all of you. So you can send an email to contact at kushalmehra.com. Please do send me an email and I will forward your email. I will not reply to your email, but I will forward your email to Hindu groups or Indian groups in Canada. To all of you who have already emailed me, I forwarded each and every, if you're a student, or if some of you also wanted to volunteer, I forwarded your emails to uh, Indo-Canadian uh, groups that help uh, that help students. So don't worry. We have your back. Uh, we care for you. Uh, do not panic. Nothing's going to happen. Canada is not an enemy nation. Canada is a friendly nation. But I once again want to remind all of you that behind all of this, is the uh, the the jet punjabi gang war and to innocent juts who are suffering because of this to innocent punjabis who are suffering because of this have some time and shed a tear for them a bunch of gangsters in indian punjab or the indian northern belt and the canadian province primarily british columbia and some of them now have entered Van uh, ontario too are creating havoc for some of us who are most of us who are innocent bystanders who watch this this entire shit show unleash on us it's not fair uh, both the indian and canadian governments have to be held responsible especially the canadian government especially the liberal and ndp government and i don't have any expectations from the ndp government when their actual leader is uh, seen hanging out with actual khalistanis all the time i don't need to showcase the evidence again and again i have shown it enough times on this podcast uh, where jigmeet singh or hagmeet singh as i like to call him has always been hanging out with khalistanis but to to the average Canadian who listens to me through this podcast, it doesn't matter which race, religion, caste you belong to. It doesn't matter. You have to care about your country and your sta standards. You have to care. 
Canada was known for certain standards. But, uh, you know, looking at this prime minister and his government, 2018, Atwal, a known convict, comes with him to India. And then they say, oh, the Indians did it. Now, recently, an actual Nazi was honored in the Canadian parliament. What did the Canadians do? They threw him under the bus. The speaker, Rota or whatever he's called. And the speaker had to resign. And as if Justin Trudeau avoided to come in the parliament too, by the way. There is a pattern. So to all my Canadian friends, when you hear Indians, you know, doubting claims of the Canadian government, ask yourself this question. How can anybody take the Canadian government and whatever comes out of their mouth seriously when this is their standard of investigation, where Nijjar is called a plumber, an activist, when Nijjar has been terrorizing people, people of his own community. So have some shame and deal with this menace, which is primarily your menace, Canada. This is a, a Jat Punjabi Canadian gang war. Yes, India has an angle to it and I will never deny. But this is a Canadian problem. Canada needs to own up to its issues and needs to solve them. And, you know, avoiding this for political reasons is not going to solve the problem. I will wrap today's podcast over here. Once again, I want to request each and every one of you. This podcast runs on the support of its members and only its members. So if you can support this podcast and give me the freedom to talk like I did today, very, I even criticized the Modi government is because members like you support me. So whether on YouTube or on Patreon or on Fanmo, if you can, please become a member of the podcast. That monthly support gives me the strength to experiment with topics and talk about uh, truthful things without any fear of repercussions. If you can't do that, at you can and you want to send one time donations at least indians can send one time donations through upi i think uh, north americans use some zoom or something to send donations one time you can also buy the charvak podcast merchandise on kadak merch or on kushalmehra.com both areas international ones have to go on kadak merch the local indian ones can go to kushal mehra if you can do nothing of this just like this video subscribe to the charvak podcast on youtube Leave your comments in the comment section. If you're an audio-only listener, you know, leave a rating on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts. I'll try my best to come bring interesting topics for you. I'll see you next time. Until then, namaste, take care, goodbye.